Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome back to the Opportunistic Trader. It's 1.30 on Monday, October 15th, and we're joined by Adam Collins of Movement Capital. Adam joins us every week to talk about uh, the latest COT report, what's changed, and market seasonality. Uh, he has a number of different websites that go over all this information. Um, uh, Movement Capital, um, um, Market COT report. You know what? I'm going to let Adam have it because uh, mention what those are because I don't have it in front of me today. But uh, tons of information. No worries. No worries. Adam, please mention what sites and uh, take it from there. No, for sure. I will at the end. Uh, well, welcome, everybody. I'm happy to be doing this right off the bat. None of this is investment advice, so don't treat it as such. And if there are any new listeners, what I mainly talk about is called COT data. That just is a report that's put out each week by the CFTC, and it outlines how different types of traders are positioned in the futures market. So, for example, like here's, here's a you know, snapshot COT report. And the issue with it is that it just shows, you know, longs and shorts as of one week. You need to know the context of that. If, you know, a trader, the trader category is super long or super short relative to the past. And so my solution is I just make a five-year percentile out of it. So these lines at the bottom, they range from zero to hundred percent. It's for two main types of categories. So for example, in commodities, you've got the actual companies that like produce and use the commodity. And then you've got the speculators we don't have like a cash interest in the business, but are just trying to make money. And so, for example, like right here, or let's say like right here, uh, when this white line was like 95%, that meant that speculators were super net long corn futures. And while that was a sample size of one, that ended up being a uh, you know a pretty bad time to to get long corn. Anyway, so there's you know this whole website, and it it outlines. Um, not just in you know one contract, it's a bunch of different contracts, but the main page that I'll look at if I want to quickly gauge how traders are positioned in the futures markets is the dashboard page. And so we've got the different categories here. We've got the top two are speculators, and that's like either slow money, like asset managers and mutual funds, or fast money, like leveraged uh, funds and CTAs. Then we've got the other main trader type, which are the hedgers. So in commodities, those are producers and users in financial futures like the S&P. Those are dealers. So let's talk about current positioning. Where it's interesting to me right now is that soft commodities for the longest time were a very crowded short trade among speculators. And they still are to some degree, but what's new is that they are ripping. And so this is um, quite, quite violent short covering, not only in coffee, but also in sugar. It's sort of like almost identical chart patterns in both. And they're similar not only in price action, but in positioning. So over here, you can interpret a reading on the far right side, like for example, 0% in gold right now, that says that speculators haven't had this low of net spec exposure to gold in five years. And we've got the soft commodities I mentioned, KC is coffee and then sugar SB is right here. So they're not super extreme positioning, but what I'll say is this, is if somebody looks at you know these charts and say oh you know we've we fully worked out all of the crowded shorts I wouldn't be so quick to say that um, positioning is still quite tilted to the short side of those contracts and so soft commodities are definitely on the move um, we've got what else we can zoom into gold's chart oh and by the way so like if this is the dashboard chart this is the individual chart for coffee and sort of a template for it the the recent downtrend that's persisted since like early 2017 late 2016 is quite similar to this sort of period and that it was just this, you know, constant grind lower with like minimal, you know, whipsaw. But obviously you can see that when the trend did change in coffee, typically it was associated with like, you know, crowded spec short positioning. When the trend changed, it really changed. So the price of coffee went from, you know, 100 to 200 ish. And so you're looking at a double in um, a couple months. And so it's just something to be aware of if let's say, let's say you're running a trend following model, it might have been kicked out of it last week, but um, basically coffee and a lot of these soft commodities have a tendency to, when they rip, they really rip. And we can zoom in on sugar to, let's see, do, do, do. here's sugar. And so this is a view of, you know, specs have been leaning short sugar for about a year, year and a half. It got a little bit more acute uh, this summer. And now price action is going against some, you know, definitively. And all I say with, with COT, you know, it's one thing to know if there is extreme positioning, but it's another thing to know if price action 
is hurting the, the majority of people. And so, you know, when sugar was in a steady, steady downtrend, you've got, you know, specs lean and short, they're, they're doing what is sort of like what's rational in the sense of they're, they're being rewarded for the short position. They're not under pressure to liquidate. And so it makes sense. But if you get crowded, either short or long positioning and price action that goes the opposite way, that typically equals, you know, more explosive setups like we're seeing right now. We can talk about other stuff too. So like this chart showed, gold is by far the most, it has the most extreme short spec positioning across all the commodities that track. And so we can zoom into the individual gold chart. Let's see, right here. All right, so it's honestly nothing new. Um, you know, specs have been, you know, quite pessimistic for a month or two now and price of gold's dropped around. You know, it's perked up a little bit this morning, but that's not enough, in my opinion, to sort of budget. But if, if you got a situation of where gold over the next, you know, week or two pops, you know, 5%, 10%, then um, I don't know. That, that would definitely put a lot of these players under pressure. Then let's talk about, I wrote some, uh, some other contracts. Then we got Coco. So Coco has been this, this massive roller coaster over the past year or so. You know, it was, it got down to the 1800s spiked up to 2800 which is a huge move and then basically gave most of it back what's sort of unique now is that we're just now getting back to crowded positioning territory and so like right here when this white line is like you know 50 percent 40 percent that says nothing to me i don't pay attention to it It says positioning sort of like in the middle of its historical range but now it's actually truly getting extreme both on the spec side and the commercial side let's turn to natural gas i wrote that one down too and in fact, the one to look at in natural gas is the image. So I'll scroll to it. Let's see, right here. Okay, so traders are traders are net long. I don't know the exact figure. It's a roughly around a billion net long, which doesn't sound like a lot because I mean Henry Hub net gas is a, a big market. But if you look at the history of that time series, this is this is pretty bullish spec positioning in that gas. Um, you know, it's been a little higher before, but relative to the past eight years we're definitely on the upper end of the range we can look at uh oj too so i know it's a very illiquid contract probably very few people trade it but um spec positioning in oj is near a you know a 12-year extreme and that historically has not worked out well ever um and then we've got wti and so wti is interesting because the spec long position is starting to come in not super quick but but definitely so and so this is looking at the spec position as a percent of open interest. And you might ask, you know, weird, you know, this orange line, it sort of just trends up over time. It's because all these commodities are becoming more financialized. Um, and so I guess that's a, that's a personal opinion on that. But any, anyways, when it comes to WTF futures, uh, speculators are, are taking down their net long positioning. And so we saw highs of like, I don't know, net longs of like 53 billion. And now we're right at 41, 42. So it's still, it's still quite elevated. Um, it's a little less extreme than it was. And then let's talk, let's talk currencies. So let's see, turning back to the dashboard. If we're looking at financial futures, where is the extreme positioning? It is in currencies on both sides. On the super long side, traders are super long. The Mexican peso against the USD. On the short side, they're very short. The yen and the New Zealand dollar against the USD. And so let's look at those individual charts specifically. Um, let's see, where is it? I've got the yen right here. Okay. All right. So uh, yeah, traders are very short yen against dollar. And if you are in the camp of you expect sort of risk off sentiment to strengthen over the next couple of weeks, obviously we all know that yen typically you know rallies when risk doesn't. And if that were to materialize, the current positioning in the yen would sort of be an accelerant to that. At least that's how I, I think about it. What's uh, What also interested me too is for the longest time, or I guess it was just a couple of months, the Swiss franc was a really crowded short against the USD. And what's, what's interesting to me is that the crowded positioning sort of worked itself off without a big price action catalyst, meaning that like the franc really hasn't moved a ton, but yet shorts sort of threw it in and positioning is no longer really crowded in that currency. And then finally for currencies, the peso. Now I'll be the first to say that the CME Mexican peso contract is quite thinly traded, but I will say 
that um, at least on the long side, it's historically been a pretty good tell when specs were overloaded on the long side. So we had, you know, an instance in, in August 2017, which was a, you know, hindsight's 2020, but that was a poor time to put on long peso exposure. And then similar to, um, to May 2013. And so I guess be aware of that. That's sort of the load into the EM trade, but traders are quite bullish on the peso. Now we can turn to stocks. Uh, let's see. All right. So remember with the COT report, this covers positioning as of last Tuesday's close. So the report's released on a Friday. It covers as of the most recent Tuesday. So we are getting right now a snapshot of a quite close snapshot of exactly how people were positioned rolling into, um, you know, tail end of last week's market volatility. And it was not pretty <laughs> in terms of in the Dow, uh, they were mega net long. And then, Probably even more interesting is that in VIX futures, they were carrying a, uh, a monster net short. So let me look at the, the VIX position right here. Okay. So yeah, traders were carrying a net short position around one and a half billion uh, as of last Tuesday's close, which was not a good position to carry into the next couple of days. Um, and so that was, uh, that was a bloodbath. But we can look at some other charts. So we've got S and P. And by the way, of all these, I pay most attention to S and P just because there's way much more money trading in that contract relative to like the Nasdaq and the Dow. And so traders were uh, they went into late last week um, leaning that long, but the positioning was definitely less extreme than late January. And so you know, it was optimism was consensus, but not extremely so. And we can look at some more um, some more charts. We've got. Let's see, we got S&P mini. So in dollars, they were like net long, like 75 billion or so. This is looking at all, all three contracts, NASDAQ, Dow, S&P. And um, yeah, it's definitely on the, on the upper end of its historical range. We've got the Nikkei. So Japanese stocks are quite a consensus long right now. I guess I slice and dice it a different way. So this is VIX, just like different flavors of it. Sort of interesting to me that... Um, yeah, the dollar amount of open interest in VIX futures rising. That's a function of, um, you know, as as the as the VIX futures increase in value, you know, per contract, um, a set amount of like longer shorts is going to be represent more more dollars. And then this is just looking at VIX futures positioning in the net number of contracts for speculators, and it's not near the um, like the early 2016 extremes, but it's definitely leaning really short. And now we can turn to some other stuff. We can turn to seasonality. So looking for October, October seasonality is defined by two trends. We have historically weak uh, energy performance, be it, it's everything. It's WTI, RBOP, you know, net gas. On the flip side, we've got historically strong agricultural commodities. And we're starting to see that actually in oats today. Well, specifically not just oats, but last I checked this morning, oats are up like 4%. And that sort of, uh, tail uh, dovetails with the fact that in the oat futures curve, uh, it's quite backwardated, meaning that front month oat futures are selling at a premium to the second month. And that is beneficial to longs because it means that there's sort of like a positive expected value from, from rolling in that position or maintaining long exposure. If we're looking at other commodities in the shape of their futures curves, uh, it's typical in that, you know, wheat, corn, coffee, nat gas, steep contango, aka costly to maintain long exposure. Now, this is a momentum chart just showing you what's gone up a bunch, down a bunch over the past uh, year. Best performer, WTI, worst performer, lumber, which it was only a few months ago when lumber was uh, over on this side of the graph. We can zoom into some individual seasonality stuff. So Cocoa uh, sort of stands out as having really bad October seasonality historically. It's been the worst month of the year over the past two decades. And then we've got, what else did I write down? 30-year bond, uh, similar case, not, not to the same magnitude, but October's historically been the worst month of the year for the 30-year treasury. Another thing about the 30-year treasury that I think is interesting is that, so over here, this chart on the right, all this stuff on the left, this is seasonality. On the right is different stuff. This is looking at momentum, specifically 12-month momentum. And you might ask, and I get emails that are like, why do you look at that? Why do you chart that? It's because momentum is a, it's a trend metric. And a lot of these commodity markets are not dominated by CTAs, but they're definitely big players. And 12-month momentum is sort of a, sort of a long-term trend-following proxy. And so if I know what that is, I can sort of get a gauge on how, uh, how CTAs are positioned. 
And the 30 year bond, this isn't a, isn't a surprise, but obviously momentum's really negative. People are quite short. And what's interesting more so to me is that over the past decade, Momentum has rarely dipped negative, and when it has, it's typically been met by, you know, quick bounces, as in, in plain English, that just says, you know, corrections in bond futures have been relatively short-lived. We've, we've been in a bond bull market. It's just, I mean, it's just changed in that this market has bled lower, uh, and it has not been strong. Um, let me turn to, similar in the Euro USD, momentum's negative, so long-term trend followers are probably leaning uh, bearish on the Euro. And then, and I've got plenty of other seasonality charts we can dive into. Obviously, S&P um, seasonality is quite strong historically in Q4. But that is not to say we cannot have, you know, a correction. Now we can turn to my last website, which is, um, this is just looking at different sort of indicators that are relevant to the S&P, technicals, sentiment, interest rates, macro. So technicals, um, technicals are still intact for the uptrend, uh, definitely took a hit. But here's another a way to view momentum. Um, and a lot of another reason why I look at this, there's a lot of money um, from like traditional financial advisors that is tactical and is sort of like long or in cash the S and P based on trend or momentum measures. And we none of those systems, if they're you know midterm or long term in nature, have triggered. But uh, uh, but basically, if they do, um, that says to me that you're going to have some people you know pull exposure. And historically, that's been a it's like the blue line is pulling S and P exposure if the you know trend is negative. The white line is buy and hold, and you know both both on a regular like 200 day moving average trend or 12 month momentum. Those simple trend following rules have uh, historically you know worked well, uh, but that has that says nothing about the future. Other technical stuff we've got seasonality kicks in on November one for the S and P. So historically, that's been the best six month period of the year, November one to April 30. FOMC drift, we just entered that period. So it's sort of quirky, but it's the historical tendency of the S&P to rise in the 20 trading days before an FOMC announcement. And since the next one is November 1st, uh, we're, we're within that period. This is probably the most relevant technical thing I'll talk about is that, you know, 2018 has been dominated by the narrative of buybacks and every single company that is reporting, you know, Q3 earnings. That means that there's an additional company that's sort of able to buy back their stock again. And so we're sort of quickly exiting the blackout period for company buybacks, which means that expect to see more of a corporate bid for stocks just because they can now. And turning to sentiment, um, obviously it's changing. It hasn't been this huge, you know, shift, but um, but traders are getting, you know, marginally more bearish on the S and P from like last week's survey data. We've got so like this is the CBOE uh, total put call ratio. So it's not the index, it's not the equity, it's the total. And we can see it's ticking up, but it's definitely it's not screaming fear to me. And so I wouldn't if somebody says, oh, you know, right now sentiment's you know fearful. I would disagree with that. Um, I would say these sentiment measures are broadly um, a little bit more pessimistic, but not extremely so. VIX futures are in backwardation. And so you can see how, you know, historically that, that's worked out over the past. We can look at interest rates. Um, I'll look at the treasury yield curve spread, how it shifted, the Fed spread. But the one I'll talk about this week is high yield spreads. And so I like to look at high yield spreads and where they are relative to like a moving average. Basically, if spreads are blowing out or contracting. And it's so minute, um, just because spreads have been so tight recently. But basically, uh, U.S. high yield spreads are now greater than their 12 month average, and so that was uh, that was sort of interesting. U.S. macro data is still very strong, although the one thing I'm keeping an eye on is that so like 30 year mortgage rates are at like a seven or eight year high. I think they eclipse like five percent, and so there's there is somewhat of a relationship between you know mortgage rates and you know new housing activity demand. And so, um, I don't know, that's sort of the one area of macro data that I'm watching more so just because it's sort of more mixed right now. And I think the balance could potentially shift it negative. But this is this is housing prices, which is more so backward looking and they're still very much positive, you know, year over year. But yeah, I mean, all the all the U.S. macro stuff, industrial production, retail sales, unemployment rate, SMPMA, all this is very, very healthy. Um, and that is pretty much it. If anybody's got any questions, I'm happy to help out.
Yeah, great stuff, Adam. Thank you very much. Uh, so, you know, it's been a volatile week and or past 10 days or so. So there are a number of questions, actually. And it, I guess one comes from uh, this date is taken, as we all know, at the end of business on Tuesday. And on Wednesday was when we saw a large sell off in the S&P. We started to, you know, Monday and Tuesday was volatile, but Wednesday was a really big sell off. So how do you think the picture is now in the S&P? Oh, I mean, a lot of equity markets, I guess. <laughs> that SPAC definitely took in long exposure and piled in more shorts. And so it's a thing to me of like, okay, so like look at the yes chart. Okay, so it does. So as of last year today, they were net long, like basically 75 billion. Let's say they get a. I don't know if something rapid... changed on the audio, but your audio is not as clear. All right. What about, what yes, about now? Much better. Okay. All right, cool. Um, okay, so anyways. A, I have no idea, you know, like what the exact number would be. But even if, let's say specs went from net long 75 billion to net long, I don't know, 60 billion, basically a 15 billion move in a week, which honestly is a quite, quite large of a move. Even if that's the case, and let's say, you know, this Friday we found out, hey, you know, traders are net long only 60 billion of ES futures. It, it's still a lot. Like it's still a large number um, relative to the past 12 years that this chart shows. And so, I'll be, I'll be interested to see. I'll probably, honestly, be more interested to see how much of the short position in big futures got taken in just because it was, um, and I talked about it before, about how, you know, most people talked about in January, hey, everybody short big futures. The, the net short VIX position in late January, early February, honestly, wasn't that big. Um, and we had eclipsed that over the past month or two. And so, you know, going into it, they were net short like one and a half billion. I'll be interested to see how much how much this moved. If they basically saw this vol spike and said, hey, we're just as, you know, because we all saw that in early February, the vol spike completely retraced very quickly. It was it paid to sort of stay short throughout that. Um, I'll be interested to see how they're positioning, if it sort of mimicked that of saying, hey, we're just going to stay short or if they got mega spooked and let's say this net spec position, I don't know, reduced by like a billion or so. So that's probably what I'll be looking at. Interesting. And so we'd be looking to get the next update on Friday regarding close of business tomorrow uh, for Correct. VIX and uh, equities. Uh, I guess next, actually taking a look, natural gas, that was pretty interesting chart you showed there. While you mentioned it's not the largest, it doesn't seem like a huge amount of open interest. When you look historically, it over the past 10 years or, yeah, does that chart actually show 10 years? About that amount of time. We're near the highest, uh, second highest, basically, in spec positions. And we have seen a large move once we broke above that $3 level, got up to about 335 yeah. Um you know, any sort yeah. of thoughts there or on what that might mean? Yeah, a couple. So two things. One, it's important to note that this is for the, you know, the more liquid Henry Hub contract. There's a million and one different regional nat gas contracts. And then two, um, yeah, so nat gas is an interesting market in that. So all these markets, you know, nat gas, WTI, some of the like soft commodities, they're unique in their composition of the market. So in some markets, hedgers dominate, meaning they control a lot more of the open interest. Other markets are more spec, spec dominated and that gas is one of those markets. So knowing that, um, maybe in my mind, you would potentially assign more weight to how you know, speculators are positioned in that gas simply because they're a bigger slice of the pie. Um, but yeah, it's one of those things of, you know, it's it's rewarded these traders recently to to be biased long net gas and I wouldn't I wouldn't doubt that if the trend were to continue in their way but if you had a situation where you know either the rally stalled out or we we fell sort of a material amount five ten percent you've got a lot more people who'd be caught off sides and so it's uh, it's interesting too because it's been a while since you know positioning has been extreme in net gas. Yeah. yeah, well, it has been a while. We've been in such a range for a long time. Yeah. Not much volatility, and um, you know, it'll, it's pretty interesting because I think if we correct, uh, you know, a bit lower, it could lead to another frustrating sort of chop. Um, but that said, we are 
you know, near the upper end of this range and the market is bullish and we've been hearing from a number of people on the opportunistic trader for a few different reasons why it should continue higher. So we're definitely keeping a close eye on that. Uh, I guess the other thing was gold. Uh, you brought it up and you talked about it, but for the first time, once again, similar to NAC gas in a way, we were trading in a nothing range for a number of months and uh, the market was short. You've been talking about that for a long time and we're finally popped above 1215, which has been the recent high. Um, uh, you think there's more room to go over here based on the data? Uh, I mean, there's, so it's definitely, well, here's what's interesting to me, sort of. It doesn't appear big on this chart, or rather I'll go to the top one. Yeah. So this showed that the net spec position in dollars for gold. What's sort of interesting to me is that gold over the past you know, month or so hasn't really moved, right? But traders have actually ramped up their net short exposure. Not a ton, but they've gone from like, you know, basically net flat, you know, an offsetting amount of long to shorts to, to pushing the pedal on shorts. And that says to me that these were people that were late to it and that they sort of layered on more short exposure after the majority of the big down move happened. And I, I don't really like talking about, you know, strong hands, weak hands, but that, that to me does say that if gold were to continue to pop, probably the first people that would go to liquidate were the people who put on fresh short exposure and they didn't even capture any, any meat of the down move, you know, two, three right. months ago. And so, um, so yeah, that, that was sort of interesting me when I updated this. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, I, I think that the really interesting times, it'll be really interesting to see the next report, which will reflect a lot of the information that we saw, a lot of the volatility that we saw from last week. So I'm interested to see the equity, the bonds, uh, crude as well. You know, crude, once again, taken from last Tuesday, it was Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, we had the big sell off. And it, looking at your chart of crude, it was pretty interesting that the specs, we had a large spec long position probably three weeks ago, four weeks ago. And, uh, you know, we dropped from about the $75 level down to 71. So we'll see what that uh, positioning looks like as well. I fear that uh, some of the weaker hands like you've been talking about, maybe guys that got involved above 72, 73, 74, yeah. 75, opposed to these guys that got involved in the mid 60s that have been long from the mid or high 60s. Um, you know, those guys might have been shaken out so we'll see that but it'll be really interesting to take a look at that next week um but yeah thank you very much adam collins uh we really appreciate it yeah as always happy to do it all right talk to you later see ya